Well, I under you 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 quote Dr. Martin Luther King. It's very uh, appropriate because he, in one of his last sermons, he actually talks about something related to Marikana. May have been in 1960, but he says, "If you've not discovered what you can die for, you're not fit to live." And it's a, it's a someone he gives as if he could see that he was going to die. And so we, we are here to talk about people who had discovered people who discovered what to die for. And of course, they shouldn't have died. And they say, actually, people do not die. The only time they die is when we stop remembering them and when we stop remembering what they died for. And I'm very happy today that um, Father Bishop Paul Varen is here, an old friend. And I also ask a friend of mine of close to 40 years, I'm about to disclose my age, Aubrey Majiki. I call them, I call him because, and I'm happy that uh, Father Varen is here, that what I'm going to talk about are four things. One is, where does this death of an African person comes from? Where does it come from? What causes it? And I'm going to emphasize that because it talks about the two of them will know this better, what I call the colonial project and the castration, the spiritual castration of African people and the subsequent deaths of African people since 1652 to now. But of course, I don't want us to keep remembering people who died as if they do not have names. They are a crowd that just disappeared. And I know this is a lecture, but I think it's important to call up their names before we, we talk about certain theories. And secondly, I'm going to talk about what really causes their death and what causes the death that we experience today because we live with the violence that killed them, because we live with poverty and we tolerate it. And you can only judge human beings by two things, what they do and what they tolerate watching being done. And so we hear because the following people died. It's Toby Lempumza, it's Tabile Telejane, it's Anelem Dizeni, thank you. It's Makosandi Lemkonjwa, it's Julius Mangojwa, it's Genevieve Liao, it's Tabi Soma Sebetane, it's Mafoli Simabia, it's Ntanda Zonogamba, it's Fezile Sapendu, it's Sitele Kajela, it's Henry Pato, it's Michael Ngwei, it's Patrick Akona Chilase, it's Bongo Siona, it's Andre Simsenyeno, it's Mzugisi Sompeta, it's Jackson Leura, it's Mpuzeni Ngande, it's Mpangeni Lekusa, it's Mongezeleli nature, it's Tabisi Leyana, it's Mkuneni Noka, it's Kwawamare Elias Munesa, it's Bongani Dongopele, it's John Lidingwane, it's Baba Alom Chasi, it's Tembinko Sikwelani, it's Kosiabo Kolabile, it's Bongani Mze, it's Taleng Muhai, it's Mudiswatsile Sakalala, it's Mulefi Ntwele, it's Hassan Fundi, it's Franz Matlomula Mabelane. It's Tapelo Eric Mabebe. It's Tembela Kemati. It's Hendrik Tieti Muhene. It's Silo Roni Lipaka. It's Sandy Teise. It's Mlanduli Henry Saba and Pumzile Sokanyile. Thank you. I actually thought we should start but just saying we gather here because a couple of you, if not all of you, and I've, I'm happy that I have this opportunity because AMCO has not been recognized enough. 
and Bab Matunjo, what I want to recognize is this, is that the advent of what we call our democracy has come up with a couple of things. And one of them is the retreat of God. I told Bishop Vorey now that one of the first victims of post-colonial and democratic dispensation is God. The retreat of God, he's chased away from our space. The second is truth. The reason we don't, I brought my office here because <laughs> um, I tend to make reckless statements. It's truth, it's my truth, but maybe they tell me don't go there. But I go there, and AMCU was the first, and the EFF as well, by the way, they were the first to tell the truth when it was not fashionable to tell the truth to our new state. Because we all feared this state. We fear comrades that we worked with. We fear them because we want to keep our double-storied houses. We fear them because we want to keep our cars. We fear them because we don't want to die. And so AMCU was probably one of those first, well, the first union to show us that we have to face our new rulers right in the face and tell them the truths they don't want to hear. And for that, I think you... And we gather here when the liberation movement and many other formations that have pretended for so long to lead our people have failed to call to order those who took the political decisions to kill African people. And I say it's the decision to kill African people because it's old. And as I tell you about why I think we get killed and why we kill one another, and I'm going to talk about the question of race, of the African body, and why it is about lack of self-respect by our own leaders. I say this because the people who were at the helm at the time when these people died occupy high offices in our country. Yes, we've paid damages because we believe money can heal people, but it's not true. What we've not done and we've allowed to happen is that the political leadership that administered the killing of these African people remain at the helm and have never been called to account. And I'm going to talk about these three arms of government in this country that we fear, that we do not call to account. That's the judiciary, that's the legislature, and that's our executive. That continue to administer because they form this elite pact of people who've forgotten, who've grown a distance between them and the ordinary person. Ironically, this death and these lives of Africans are killed because they are cheap. And these lives die because we do not value African life. If 34 white people had died in this country, our leaders would not forget to remind us every day. They would create monuments in each and every street corner they wouldn't have opened the speech at the union building yesterday without acknowledging them. Because ironically, we live because of what I call spiritual castration of the African person. We live our lives trying to please the very people that don't think we are human. And our leaders, our leaders are at the helm of this consistent, persistent, desire to please the people who don't like our race, who keep it down. And these are the truths we don't want to tell because we have now commercial interests in the new order. And it is for that reason that 34 people are killed simply because they are asking for 12,000 rand money most of us give to our children 
to go to university as a money they must use to buy a phone, to buy airtime. And these people buy, I mean, died asking for 12,000 rand. They were not even asking for what they should have asked for, which is that we must co-own the minerals of this country, that the land and minerals of this country must belong to the people who were found here, indigenous people. No, they didn't die for that. Worse still, we speak in high terms to please the people who own mines where our people died and got ex exploited every day. And as I say, we do this because what I call the original sin. And this sin starts with people who, 82 people, 82, it's a shame. We should be ashamed of ourselves as indigenous people that 82 people in three ships sailed on our shores in 1652, 80 of them. It was 72 men and eight women in the dromedaries and the other two ships. They settled, and from that day on, our lives changed. So we gather to remember those people who, from time to time, since 1652, have died as a symbol of our suffering, as a symbol of our pain, and largely as a symbol of how we betray one another when we have power. And so those people are victims of what I call the original scene of our spiritually vacuous leaders. The leaders who've decided in this continent that even when they take political power, that political power is not used to uplift our ordinary people. Now, of course, yesterday I was listening to the president and <laughs> it occurred to me that we are led by people who've simply forgotten what it was that we struggled to overturn. And as we speak about poverty, we do not realize that those who are poor, who live in dehumanizing poverty, live with violence every minute of their lives because poverty is violent. You must ask those who live in it. And there are many people who pretend that they know violence. But poverty is violent. And I must acknowledge my other friend, Dali, who just walked in because he walks that path that I was talking about, that it's the path of telling truth to those we fear. And he's been at the helm since the day one of marijuana. And he gets called by all sorts of names. Uh, and it, it comes with the territory. Truth-telling is a lonely path. Truth-telling is not a popularity contest. I'm not popular for making the speeches I make. No one is, and we don't want popularity. But it is our job to remind everyone that has forgotten that we must hold our leaders accountable for what they do we must hold the traitors who drip in black, green, and gold, deceiving our people that they've led them when they've done what I call a grand betrayal of our people. And we are scared to tell them because we do not want the consequences of truth-telling. And I say to you that the worst form of oppression is the one in which you participate because you have no alternative. And that is where we are in South Africa at the moment. And it is no longer credible for Africans who are in the majority to complain about white and colonial control. Yes, that's the original sin. When 80% of the population and their leaders and their liberation movement are controlled by less than 20% of the country, it's a shame. When a few people who control 80% of the economy 
to the exclusion of 80% of the population, that population must ask itself serious questions. And I don't want to talk about our leaders because I think at that level we know what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who've consciously decided to betray the rest of the population for their commercial interests. And so those people that we remember today are a symbol to me of what I called our sins because we are spiritually vacuous people but also because we do not mind betraying ourselves and our own, and we do not mind letting our own die. It's not new. It's a shameful act of betrayal of the African people who have never known peace, who've never known prosperity since they were born. All of you in this room, each one of you, whether you like it or not, have never known prosperity. And if we allow things to continue as they are, You'll never know it. Your children will never know it. Their children will never know it. So what really, what really is wrong with us? What is it that makes us betray one another even when we have the so-called political power? What is it that when our leaders are released from jail in 1990 and 1992, they did not go to the grave of Robert Sobukwe? They did not go to Ziggy Bigo, the wife of Steve Bigo. They didn't go to the wife of Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe. They went to Fervurt's wife to hug and kiss her. I am not attacking Mandela for this. Mandela could do whatever he liked for being magnanimous. I'm saying this because it symbolizes our conduct towards our own. That Ziggy Bigo and Mrs. Sobukwe were not the first to get a hack from our leaders who were from Robben Island, symbolizes our attitude toward blackness. So what exactly are we dealing with? What is it that was taken away from our spirit? And let me tell you what it is. The colonial project, Yes, was about taking the wealth, the mineral resources of the country. And that you could get back if you grow enough courage, by the way. But what is it that makes us not grow sufficient courage to take back what is ours? It is because the colonial project took much more than money from a black person. It took away our humanity. So we can have as many judges as you like. You can have as many presidents as you like and you can have many members of parliament as you like, and they can be as black as you like. One thing about each one of them is that they do not like blackness. They do not like themselves. And for everything they do, they seek white approval before they do it. They don't seek your approval. The reason they tell you about something called the balance of forces, in short terms, in simple terms, what our Comrades call the balance of forces is nothing but a justification for fearing a white minority in our country. That's the forces they are balancing. So, we gather. But two, last time I spoke about this, it was people in Phoenix who died yet again. Ngati, the situation says Zulu sit deep, sing faga in trouble because people say I'm asking for revenge, which I am asking for. City aguko zinyane lemvubu la jiwa zingwe nya kwa now, of course, people literally think I'm asking for people to go out and kill others and revenge. No. I'm asking each one of us to make sure that the suffering, the death of people in Marikana, in Phoenix, in Kukuletu, in Nyanga, in Langa, in Sharpville, and everywhere else where an African blood has been spilt must not happen in vain. 
you may be next. You definitely may be next. And this is not a question that only black people must do. It's something that all of those who recognize humanity and human emancipation must do. And that doesn't have to be black. The human spirit exists in each one of us. And these are truths that are about each South African, black, white, striped, and dotted. And so I'm happy that I'm here today, but I'm unhappy that we're celebrating, we're commemorating something that shouldn't have happened. The Marikana massacre, as I said, was a symptom of the attitude of South Africa's new leaders towards their own people, towards poor African people. It was a marker, a shining light to expose what slaves do to other slaves when they taste power and become nothing but an extension of the old, exploitative, white capitalist and murderous hand. It is an utter shame about which they show no remorse. We can spend, how many years is it now? 11 years, we've been asking one man to say sorry. And he hasn't. And when I say one man, I don't mean Cyril Ramaphosa only. I mean the entire cohort that administered the death of their own people. We're not asking for money. They, they can't say sorry. It's not because of pride, by the way. It's because the value of your life, because you are black, because you are African, is not recognized. I tell you now, the day two white South Africans die the way we have died, this country will change. I don't know whether for the better or the worst, but it will change. It tells you what we mean, not only to those who oppressed us, but what we mean to those we entrusted with our country to lead us. We mean the same to them that we meant to those who killed our people in Soweto or Sharpeville and everywhere else. They do this sometimes unconsciously and sometimes in the name of sophistication they ignore the cries of our people. They have imbibed as common sense the neoliberal logic and see it as something that must be done because it's universal. And it keeps our miners down underground working for something less than 12,000 rand because if they went beyond that, the threat of concomitant action will come for them to die for demanding something most mine owners spend having a dinner or breakfast with a friend. They kill and poison each other these days, and you would think they fight because they differ about how best to lift African lives. No, they fight about who must take the biggest crumb from the table of their master. They crave the recognition of the system that their people ask them to fight. We kill, we condemn, and despise ourselves in our tragic and contradictory quest to seek freedom, whose basis is the permanent happiness of oppressive classes that we hate. We are a pathetic lot, if we must admit. We are a pathetic lot because we are a majority that should not accept one woman, one African woman, one African man to go to sleep, to bed hungry. We shouldn't, if we valued our lives. And for that, I say we must seek to stop, if we can, our desire to seek validation from people who don't like our race, people who don't like other people, and create a South, Af a South Africa between black and white and everybody else that value human life because it's human life not because it's white. We shouldn't be here 30 years later. The Marikana massacre, therefore, is a symbol of our colonially learned attitude toward black lives. 
our entire political settlement. I'm not being ungrateful when I critique this settlement because we liked it. We were fooled to think it was something nice. We voted, we formed queues. But this entire settlement was designed to ensure the continued survival of white power and to expand the tentacles of a capitalist system. It had nothing to do with us. It had very little to do with us. South Africa, ladies and gentlemen, is like a chart that we, I'm sure you all give your children charts when you're in a shop to play and crayons. And they sit there and they have different pieces of crayon with different colors. That's South Africa. We can change the color, but not the frame. We are like little children sitting in that shop corner giving crayons and a chart. But the frame on the chart cannot change. We get different colors. It can be purple, yellow, or red. And that is what we must change. And for this, the guilty people are those who occupy the three branches of government because they've become an elite pact that seeks to perpetuate the exclusion of ordinary people. And that's the judiciary, that's the legislature, and that's the executive. I know I get into trouble about saying this because we say judges can't be criticized. It's all rubbish. No one who occupies public power must be protected from criticism. None whatsoever. If Dalimbofu becomes a judge next year, God forbid, it <laughs> won't happen. <laughs> yeah, you and me, no. We must be able to tell him that he is no God. You are a repository of public power. And there's a whole story when we talk about the judiciary that when you criticize judges, you must give reasons. It means Umam Vemve sitting here must get legal advice, senior counsel, to criticize someone who occupies public power. It's all rubbish. It's something designed to make sure that ordinary people don't scrutinize us for how we abuse judicial, executive, or legislative power. Everyone who occupies those three things must get the wrath from those who gave them that power. And our leaders do this. <laughs> when I use another Zulu frame, but it's much more uh, crude. It says our leaders, Banya Indoni Nemkiwane. We are Sars Babaki. Masitu Muntung is Zulung Indoni Nemkiwane. So she got our leaders speak from both sides of their mouth. Literally, they speak from both sides of their mouth, depending on the, on the audience. Our people are told what they want to hear as if they are little children at a preschool who are asking for balloons. And that's what you are. And they will bring food parcels at a particular point. They will bring, give you damages for your brothers and sisters who died in Marikana, but they will take no accountability for it. We live in a country with no conscience. It's led by people with no revolutionary ethics. It's led by people who we can boldly say are spiritually vacuous people. It's individuals who've turned our revolutionary project into their project for personal enrichment. In the legislature, in the executive, in the judiciary, and I say boldly, without fear of contradiction, we have nothing but morally, as I said, and spiritually empty individuals engaged in an elite class pact to perpetuate the continued survival of white domination at the expense of their own people. Ours is a country ruled through an elite class pact that cuts across the three branches of the state. In the end, our people have nowhere to go when any of the branches of the state mistreats them. Where do you go? 
when your entire state has become an elite pet run for the convenience of one man. I say in this country we are reaching a point where there are leaders who will rape a two-year-old child and our system will condemn the child. Our judges will find the child guilty of getting close to the president or close to a judge. That's where we are with justice. And I've said this over and over. The test for justice is not how we deal with people we like. The test for justice is how we give it to those who need it most. The condemned, the despised, the poor. Bishop Paul Varen says to us here, right, we have forgotten to be compassionate. There is nothing needed for anyone to be a revolutionary except one thing. One thing. It's not money. It's love for human nature. It's love for those you live with. And as I said, I'm less enthusiastic about our much celebrated new democracy because it seems to me that we could have done so much in 30 years and we don't do it because we've become an appendage to the very system that has kept an African person where he or she is for centuries. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been centuries living in the state you are in. It's been centuries since you, you buried the first group of Africans that were butchered. It's been decades. None of us thought that the first victims, the first people to be killed by a post-colonial democratic state would be black. None of us thought so. Not because we thought they should have been white. But we did not think that the first victims of this democratic state would be black men and women asking for money. Most of us finish having dinner with Dalimpofu somewhere. That's, they were not asking for much. And so when I say we we led by spiritually vacuous people, I want you to understand that the death of these people that I mentioned symbolize much, much deeper problems about our society, about ourselves, and what we think of ourselves. Forget about the white class and what they think of us. We know what they think of us. It's about how do we think, what do we think of ourselves? When leaders see us, what do they see? And when we see the person sitting next to you, what do you see? And if they died, and if they told you tonight they don't have any food to eat, what would you say? And that is what we were creating, a compassionate government. We were electing people who are compassionate, who will make sure that what happened to us for more than 400 years would not happen even for a day. It continues to happen unabated. And so until that ideology of colonialism, that ideology that makes us hate ourselves, that makes us think an African person is less human. And this is not a crime committed by white people. No, we do it ourselves. Go today to any shopping center and watch the black lady treat you and watch how she treats the white lady next to you. It's different. It's because of what we think of ourselves. And until we've gone out of that decolonial, I mean, that colonial mindset, it means it's was who's tanda. And so I'm touched by this decision that you remember these people. Because for me, they've never really, no one has symbolized the nature of our new state than the people who died in Marikana. Not because the other deaths were unimportant. 
Those deaths are important as this one, but this one is important because it took all of us by surprise. And it's a sacrifice those people made and their families made to shine a light into our own consciences about what we think of ourselves and what we think of our people when we see them. Ladies and gentlemen, go around and go to Guiani, go to Guamashu, go to Kailisha, go everywhere. Go to Soweto here in Alex. Just walk there. And you tell me whether you think those people will get out of that life in the next 200 years if we continue doing the things we are doing. And so last time I suggested what we should do, and not because I'm a nihilist, I'm a very responsible senior counsel, I think, but I think we must start all over. It's time to collapse this entire system and start all over. It's time to collapse these three branches of government whose existence is the continued survival of white domination of our people. And I'm not saying you collapse them because I think we should have chaos. I think it's time we go back to the drawing boards and ask our people, do they have an education system that they think will deal with the consequences of colonialism? Do our children have an education system that you can be proud of that teaches them critical thinking so that they can be leaders one day? If this lady got ill tonight, we'll be able to access the best health care tonight. That our people during COVID had to share, um, what do you call this thingy? <laughs> the ventilator in a public hospital. Please, please use it for 15 minutes and give it to Madlamini. Please give it to um, uh, Mankosi. Is that what we fought for? Now, of course, as I said, when we say these things, we are met with sophisticated words from our comrades um, in black, green, and gold. They tell us that we do not know the balance of forces. We don't know what they are dealing with. We do know what you're dealing with. You're dealing with your dirty consciences and your assumptions that our people will tolerate this forever. And so for me, when AMCU did what it did, and a lot of people, a lot of us who grew up in the African National Congress, condemned some of you. And we did this because, of course, I always, I said to Dali the other week, we're talking, we commiserate about, we grew up in the NC. And I said, Dali, you know, this is how I feel about the revolution in South Africa. I feel like discovering that your mother was a prostitute and you didn't know and it's just been revealed. I feel that we organized our people and told them about liberation but what they didn't know that some of us were sleepers dressed in black, green and gold to deceive them. And it's for that reason that we administer massacres against them. And so, as I said at the beginning, we will be judged by history. And it will judge us two things, what we do and what we tolerate. And the second part is about each one of us. What is it that we are tolerating? And for how long are we tolerating it? Now, of course, I'm not asking you to go out and be chaotic. I'm asking you to look at yourselves and to look at the democratic spaces if you have that democratic space and do something about it. But if it doesn't work, if it doesn't work, you have to make one choice. Well, two choices. You watch the people of God suffer for the next 400 years again or you fight and destroy it so that the people of God can know liberation from that day. And if you want the 69 people who died in Sharpville, the 176 people who died in Soweto, the 35 people who died in Langa, 
the 29 people who died in Bisho, the 34 people who died in Mangana, the, the people who died in Phoenix. If you want their deaths to mean something, to turn things around, if you want our people to have an education system that is decolonial in character, that changes the education that we got that tells us that we are inferior. The education that tells us that when we are leaders, we must please the people who hate us. You just listen to how our leaders speak to our people. Every time they speak, I hear Louis Grange and Beck Botha and P.W. Botha and John Foster. Take them to a suburb and hear how respectful they are. Uh, when they speak to races that they think are superior to them. And so our task is to make sure that we support the state that we put in place. And if that state has become part of what kills us, is to remove it. Because freedom does not come from the oppressor. It comes from the oppressed. It will always come from you. You will be the first to break the chains that tie you to the system that kills you. And so if we are to create a society that respects human life, that does not subject our women to low salaries, as I didn't even know that there's still such a pay gap, <laughs> between men and women. I thought we'd gone past that. If we want to make sure that our children, even in the suburbs where we live, because we think we want to protect our little uh, corners where we live, none of us are free until all of us are free. You will live in fear for as long as there are people, millions of them, who have nothing you will live in fear behind those high walls. You will live in fear in that German sedan because you've allowed others to starve. We will never know peace until each one of us is in peace. We will never know liberation until we free inside and everybody else that we live with is free. And our lives have been turned and I mean Africans, ma many of us are lucky because we've been able to get through the system. But generally, our people, 34% of, of our children are unemployed. And our people live in queues beyond, be below the poverty line. And if we tolerate it, this idea of a non-racial South Africa in which black and white live together where color and race are irrelevant, will never happen. Every year, we will fear, what will they do to us? And we call them these people. We call them these people because we've kept them on the margins of our mainstream economy. And the people in Marigana died because of that attitude. And let me just tell you what Nguki says about this attitude. Nguki Wationgo characterizes what our leaders have become and what we have become in how we deal with blackness. As you leave this hall, the first person you will see who's white, you're going to smile at him, and the black person, you're going to show your ugly face. It's because we don't respect who we are. He says this in, his, in a lecture he gave uh, uh, in, the, in the commemorating Steve Biko. He says, colonialism tried to control the memory of the colonized or rather to borrow from the Caribbean thinker, Sylvia Winter, it tried to subject the colonized to its memory, to make the colonized see themselves through the hegemonic memory of the colonized center. Put another way, the colonizing presence tried to mutilate the memory of the colonized, and where that failed, it dismembered it, and then tried to remember it, to the colonizer's memory, his way of defining the world, including his take on the nature of the relations between the colonizer and the colonized. 
this relation was primarily economic. For nobody colonizes another for the aesthetic joy of simply doing it. The colonized as a worker, as a peasant, produces for another. And that's what you did. That's what you do daily. You produce for another. And if you demand payment, Marikana will happen. This is, of course, affected through political power. Close quote. And when I said a colonized, the colonial project does not change. It keeps changing form. And when they think you are too unhappy, it co-opts your leaders to lead the project, to lead your own death, your own colonization. And so we need a complete liberation of our minds first to see blackness as something human, to see ourselves as people who can lead human emancipation. And that requires us, it requires the churches, it requires God, it requires our, our, our traditional healers to heal our people of the self-hate they experience and to heal our fellow white South Africans to come down from their arrogant towers and lack of remorse about what they did. I always say to those white people who, are, who don't, can't tolerate the truths we tell, put yourself in our shoes for 10 days, not 400 years. Can you live the way we live for 10 days? Can you live the way my mother lived? Can you live the way my father lived, died of asthma, waking for us, sappy, and could not get to a clinic? How many of you, and all we're asking for is not to take anything away from any citizen. We love everybody. Is that we must live together as equal humans. And none of us must be killed for demanding to be human. And so I've said these things and people say, so what do we do? You know, the reason we ask this question, what must we do? It's because we are cowards. We know exactly what we must do. Each one of us educated and uneducated, we know what we must do. The reason Dali and I won't do it is because we want to protect our double-storied houses. The reason you won't do it is because they, you think they will kill you. The reason you won't do it is because the banks will close our accounts. The reason we don't do it is because our kids will, re will, will be removed from private schools. The day we regard human freedom as our priority. The day we see ourselves as equal humans who require salvation. I know it's a religious term, but that's what we need. The day each one of us, each one of us, including the sellouts who lead us, the day each one of us regard human life as worth it, the day we know that each individual was made in the image of God and requires protection of those in power, requires protection of the, our economy, our mineral resources, requires a better education system, does not need to die for demanding to be human. We shall be free. It is at that point that we'll be free. And our leaders huff and puff. They were huffing and puffing yesterday telling our people things they told them five years ago because they refused to nationalize banks. They refused to give people land without compensation, something they promised. They refused to give our people free hand. Only in this country you can debate for 30 years that human beings require free health care and a free education. If you think education is expensive, try ignorance. It is their ignorance that makes us kill, that makes them kill us. It is their ignorance that makes them angry when we tell them the truths we tell them. We don't tell them these truths because we are better. We are human like them. I'm human like each one of them. 
But most of us, since we're 18, have done nothing else but persuade our people that the struggle for liberation was worth it. I don't know what to say to most of them when I see them now. I don't know what to say to them when they say, didn't we tell you that your leaders will sell you out? And we've sold out not just one country, but the entire continent is subjected to its former colonial powers. And the reason we speak from both sides of the mouth when we talk about Ukraine and Russia, when we talk about multilateral structures, it's because we want to live a double life. We want to please Western countries who colonized us. We also want to please friends who helped us through during liberation because we don't know what we stand for. It shouldn't be that difficult to live truthfully. You shouldn't have to speak in any diplomatic terms to tell truths as a country to your people and to the world. We shouldn't be told by, by Biden what to do. We shouldn't be told by Biden which people to hate. And one of the dangers we've reached at this point is that when all of these three arms of the state the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. None of them is independent enough to tell the other you are wrong. Our people have nowhere to go. And it's at that point that they will see true insurrection. It's when our people can go to no structure of government to seek protection. And we are heading there, you're right. It's going to happen in one day. And the people will leave and go to the U.S. because they have money and they will leave us to pick up the pieces. When they privatize all state institutions because they want profits, because they are pleasing their companies, they will leave us and go and settle in Canada where their profits have gone. And we will be left to pick up the pieces, to refurbish Alexandra, to make our people live decently again. And they will call Bishop Verin to pray for us again but our country will be gone. And it's for that reason that I think the only way we can prevent Marikana from happening again is that we hold our leaders accountable or else they must ship out. And this belief, this belief that elections are what will free you it's not true. When people are corrupt, they control how elections happen. They control the results. They control the judiciary. They control parliament. They control cabinet. They control the media. And all levers of power in society. And where do you go? And I'm not suggesting that you should be violent. But I'm suggesting that when those spaces are closed... When those spaces are closed, it's not now, I don't know when, you will feel the pinch. When those spaces are closed for our workers to be human, to get benefits from what they suffer for underground and, and elsewhere, when our young people know that they have no future uh, under this system, and when those institutions of the state can no longer protect you, it is not a crime to seek other means to overthrow a government. It would be a sin to allow a sinful, evil state to destroy generations while you tolerate it, while you watch. The sin would not be turning against that system. The sin is watching it and tolerating it. When our people are condemned for the next 400 years, and as I close, let me go to where I started. These deaths do not happen by accident. They happen because colonialism has taught us to despise ourselves, to hate black lives ourselves, because we do not think we are worth it. Ladies and gentlemen, how many killers during apartheid have we been told about? Many. Cork, many of them. None of them. And I'm not suggesting the people I'm going to mention are innocent. I don't know. 
that this country can watch a woman for 12 months, Busisu M. Kwebane is being victimized on TV because she's black. It's something we've not done even to those who killed our people in 1976. And I know we do this because we are saying we are making people account. We've not made a man who said concomitant action must be taken for people to die. We've not asked him to account. Yet he has the nerve to put one black woman to be abused by men every day on TV, colluding with their white masters who handled them under apartheid when we all thought they were comrades. We tolerate it. The reason we tolerate it, we've not put Joe Mamasela there. We've not put Yon de Kock there. Many apartheid killers are at work now, handling the people they used to handle in the 80s that we thought are our leaders. And they kill us because they have become an extension of those people. Therefore, the people of Marikana, the people that I mentioned, are a symbol to us, a shining light to our consciences about what we must do, what we should never tolerate. The next time one black person is killed by this state, I want each one of you to know it's no longer government's problem. It's us. It's what we tolerate. And the next time our people live in poverty in a country that probably could be the richest country in the continent, the next time, which is tonight, an African person goes to bed without food. A child goes to school barefoot. A woman gives birth at the reception of a public hospital. When that happens tonight and tomorrow, it's no longer the fault of our government because I have given up on them as spiritually vacuous people who've betrayed their own. The problem is us, and that we've, we've decided to tolerate yet again the victimization, the exploitation, and the murder of an African body, of an African person, because spiritually we've not turned our lives to look deep inside ourselves and how do we treat black lives. And our leaders must learn from us that black lives matter, that people in Marikanas in Marikana matter, that people who died in Langa matter, that people who died um, in Sharpville matter, that people who died in Phoenix matter. And all of this sophisticated language that we hear every day and our leaders have mastered this thing of speaking for five minutes, saying nothing. Speaking English, but saying nothing about the plight of our ordinary people. And as I said, I invite you, if you think I'm too critical of this state, I invite those of you, like me, who live in suburbs, just leave your safe suburb a bit. Drive to Soweto, drive to Alex, and if you do have time, drive to our rural areas. And you tell me, those children you will see at the street corners who have nothing to do at 11 o'clock midday will ever change their lives. And if you can tolerate that, there is no hope for you. There is no hope for us. And each one of us, as I said, the challenge we have to remember people in Marika and Abab Machunjo is that I haven't heard uh, Amku again. I was inspired by Amku when it started. But I think you hold it as Amku with all the insults that you get. And as I said it to you, truth-telling is a lonely job. I don't know how many WhatsApps I'll get today to say, comrade, how can you say this? Uh, comrade, uh, it's not right, the movement. Stuff the movement. We must start imagining freedom without the ANC. We must start imagining human emancipation without the traitors that betrayed our people that we call leaders. And I don't know which political party they come from. We must start imagining human salvation simply because we are people of God, not because they are leaders we trust. 
because we must free ourselves. And that is what I'm asking. We've spent too long attaching human emancipation and human liberation to people who don't care about us. And I ask AMCO, you may not be a massive party. Truth telling does not need masses. It needs one person. It's to continue to tell people the truth. And as I said at the beginning, quoting Martin Luther King that you started with, if you have nothing you are prepared to die for, you are not fit to live. Thank you.